In 1886, the French government was preparing for a major event. They were set to host the World's Fair in Paris in 1889, and they needed something big to serve as the centerpiece. Because this wasn't just any event, but would be coinciding with the 100 year anniversary of the French Revolution. It was a momentous occasion that was to be highly regarded on the world scale, while also having a deep personal connection to the French people, whose ancestors had lived through the unbelievably harsh times a century earlier. Eventually, a commission came to the conclusion that the landmark to be created in central Paris would be that of Alexandre Gustave Eiffel. And so, quick work began to construct the Eiffel Tower. But not everyone was a fan of the design, and before construction even began, there were plans to tear down the tower. The destiny to be torn down seemed inevitable for the tower until a scientific discovery was made that would make it invaluable. This is Learn Something New. Alexandre Gustave Eiffel knew from the very beginning that his structure would be a temporary one. In 1886, when the French government held a design competition for the structure at the upcoming World's Fair, they had very strict requirements that needed to be followed. The landmark needed to be completed within three years so that it would be finished by the time the World's Fair had started. And it also needed to be easily disassembled, as the commission was planning to have the structure up for just 20 years, no longer. Eiffel thought that this would be a great honor to be chosen, so he put his construction firm to the task of coming up with a design. But although the tower which would be chosen by the commission bears Eiffel's name, it actually wasn't Eiffel himself who came up with the initial design. Instead, it was one of his employees, Maurice Coquelin, who initially drafted up the concept. Interestingly, Coquelin and Eiffel seemed to work well together, as just five years prior in 1881, the duo worked to design the internal framing structure of another major landmark that has stood the test of time and become an image of nationalism, the Statue of Liberty. But Eiffel wasn't pleased when Coquelin first brought him the designs for the Eiffel Tower, making him go back and redesign the structure several times before he was pleased with the result. It was important to Eiffel that the look was perfect in his eyes, because they had some stiff competition for the spot. Over 100 different designs were entered into the competition, including a different tower by Jules Bourdois, who wanted to build a sun tower that he claimed could illuminate the entire city. Another design to celebrate the 100 years since the French Revolution was a giant guillotine to be set in the middle of the city, though it's not hard to imagine that that one wasn't making it that far into the decision-making process. The final design that Eiffel gave his approval for to be submitted to the commission called for over 18,000 pieces of puddle iron, a type of wrought iron used in construction, as well as 2.5 million rivets. Several hundred workers would be brought on over the course of the next two years to assemble the framework of the nearly 1,000 foot high structure. As the construction was underway, however, discontent was brewing among the French people. Many architects and artists, from painters to poets and writers, who had found inspiration in the city, came together and signed a public petition in protest of the tower, calling its industrial design ugly, and a monstrosity that would be an eyesore seen all over the city for years to come. These protests, however, had little effect on the construction, especially given the short window that they had to complete it in. So, on March 31st, 1889, the tower, which cost 8 million francs, or approximately 50 million USD adjusted for inflation, would be open to the public as the world's tallest structure, just in time for the beginning of the World's Fair. The World's Fair, which lasted from the 5th of May to the end of October, attracted an astounding 32 million visitors, with admissions bringing in nearly 50 million francs, offsetting the 42 million franc cost to put it on in the first place making it the last Paris World Fair to turn a profit. In the first week of the fair, 30,000 people climbed the tower to its viewing platform, though by the end of October, that number grew to nearly 2 million. But after the World's Fair had ended, Gustave began to dread the day that his company's creation would be torn down. So he decided to save the Eiffel Tower. But first, he needed to find a reason why it could be useful for the city of Paris, beyond just its looks. So, 
he turned to the scientific community. As early as 1889, he authorized Eleutheri Mascard, the director of the French National Meteorological Service, to set up a weather observation station atop it. And in 1910, when German physicist Theodore Wolf asked if he could measure radiant energy at the top and bottom of the tower, Eiffel was more than willing to give him the go-ahead, and Wolf found more than he was expecting. You see, Theodore Wolf had believed that Earth was the source of all background radiation that could be detected. He took measurements in underground mines and caves before taking the readings at the top of the Eiffel Tower. If his theory was correct, then radiation readings at the top should be less than on the ground, but it wasn't. His electroscope was reading ionizing radiation, making him adjust his theory to say that there must be radiation coming from above. Two years later, Victor Hess would use a high-altitude balloon to confirm the existence of cosmic rays. But despite this, the clock was still ticking on Eiffel's efforts to save the Eiffel Tower, and his answer to this would lie in radio waves. This new way of transmitting messages would prove the saving grace of the tower. On November 5th, 1898, the first radio contact in Morse code was beamed from the Eiffel Tower to the Pantheon four kilometers away. A year later, a radio transmission was sent between the Eiffel Tower and London. This made military officials within the country pay more attention to the tower, installing an antenna at the top in 1903 which allowed them to use the tower for its height to send and receive signals with eastern France, 400 kilometers away. And thus, the government finally realized its importance as a radio station. The Eiffel Tower was saved, though it wouldn't be the last time its existence was threatened. During World War II, during the occupation of Paris, Hitler ordered the Eiffel Tower to be torn down, though it was an order that would never be carried out. The Eiffel Tower would remain the world's tallest structure until May of 1930, when the Chrysler Building was opened in New York City, though its appearance on the Parisian skyline would still take some getting used to, as one novelist said he hated the tower so much that he regularly ate in the restaurant on the first floor because it was the only vantage point from which he could see out over the city without having to look at the tower itself. Now, the Eiffel Tower is one of the most iconic and recognizable structures on the planet, which is visited by millions, both French natives and tourists, every year, 116 years after it was set to be torn down. Thank you for watching! If you learned something, be sure to hit the like button, because it really helps the channel grow and reach new audiences. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one!